Uh, can, can I get everybody's attention? I'm not going to use a microphone and, and uh, so that we can uh, keep our uh, electronic devices all here on the table for the people you're really here to see. My name is Nathan Green. I'm the Interim Vice Chancellor of Public Affairs. Uh, the wonderful team that put this transit <coughs> forum together today, Gail Williams, uh, Christine Bradley, Chandra Allison, um, Lynn Maddox are <coughs> part of our community, neighborhood, and government relations team. Many of you know you know them. They've been engaged in communities and in other events. So I want to per personally thank them for this event. And I have the fortune of welcoming you on our campus to talk about a very important issue. Vanderbilt loves to engage in these type of forums, especially on issues that are important to our community, and today is no different. I also have the pleasure of introducing our moderator today, a gentleman who uh, is at Vanderbilt University. His name is Craig Phillip, and Craig is the Research Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He is the Director of Vanderbilt Center for Transportation Operational Resilience, also known as Vector. We stole uh, Craig uh, several years ago from uh, Ingram Barge. He is a leader and an innovator in transportation issues. He's one of the most knowledgeable people in our community about issues dealing with rail and intermodal. Uh, he is the perfect moderator for this very important event. And again, I want to thank you all for coming here. We're going to keep the doors open so that if anyone else attends, that they can still hear the uh, debate and the forum and the presentations. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, Craig, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nathan. Can everybody uh, hear me okay? That better? That better? Okay. Well, I'm glad Nathan didn't say that I was a uh, technology guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here as well. Um, uh, I think it's uh, obviously a very important uh, topic. Witness the, uh, the outstanding attendance today. Uh, and uh, uh, there isn't enough time in this day's uh, agenda to cover everything that's important in this topic area for, for the area. We're actually going to have three of these forums. Uh, we'll have another, we'll have a second one likely on February 19th, uh, also at noon, and a third one to be scheduled. So stay tuned on that. Um, our focus of this first forum is on the transit plan that has been proposed for our city. Well, let's move Nashville. Um, next month we'll be hosting a second forum. Uh, we'll be focusing especially on some of the research that is being done on campus by a number of my colleagues uh, in the, uh, at the university on, on things relevant to the issues of mobility. Uh, and then the third one, we'll be talking about a very important issue that is also part of the conversation, I know, and that's about the intersection of these mobility issues with questions of land use. Um, and uh, particularly important for us here at Vanderbilt is we're undertaking a project called Future VU to try to imagine and envision uh, what our campus can and should look like, uh, and also very important for our region. Uh, as we struggle with these issues of housing affordability uh, and how to make our community in the long run a uh, sustainable one. As Nathan mentioned, I lead the Transportation Center. Uh, we're housed in the School of Engineering, but frankly, everything we do uh, is interdisciplinary in some fashion. Uh, I did spend my career um, uh, fighting the waterways uh, for, for Ingram, uh, and frankly, I'd call myself today a policy guy. Uh, so I want to make note of a couple of policy issues uh, that, that kind of strike me particularly as we are getting together today. Uh, last night, uh, Mayor Haslam gave his State of the State address. Uh, and Governor, Governor. Uh, Governor Haslam. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that manifested, of course, in the budget that he's proposed for his final year in office. Uh, and to be truthful about it, 
uh, the State Department of Transportation that's relevant to this issue. Um, uh, well, let's just say I don't think the, uh, the budget is kind to that department. Um, tonight our president will give his State of the Union address, uh, and he will certainly, um, if it says advertised, he will focus on infrastructure. Uh, but I think the consensus is that uh, it's unlikely that, that what he's proposing is going to help communities like us solve our problems. So in that context, it's really no surprise to me um, that the citizens of Nashville, uh, I suspect many of you, are being asked to support this plan financially. Uh, and I think it's fair to say big time support at that. Um, finally, from my policy perspective, a couple of thoughts for me personally about why uh, acting now is so essential. Uh, in addition to the fact that I don't think we're going to find the state or the federal government stepping in to really help us in a meaningful way. Um, one study suggested that we are 93rd out of 100 large metropolitan areas in the United States if you measure us in related to transit access or access to transit. And then I saw a second study that says our metropolitan area broadly defined is the fifth most sprawling of more than 200 that they measured. So especially that last statistic tells me that um, we ultimately need a regional solution to the problem uh, of mobility in our, in our region. Um, and I personally believe, given all that context, uh, given, the, given where the state is today and the federal government is today, um, that we are only going to grow into a regional system if Nashville itself commits to a comprehensive system that other counties can connect to. So with that, let me introduce our panel. The first two are going to talk about the comprehensive proposal that, is, uh, that you've probably seen a lot about in the news. Aaron Hafkenshiel is the director of our city's transportation and su sustainability department. And Steve Bland is the CEO of both the Metropolitan Transit Authority and the regional transportation authorities here in Middle Tennessee. <coughs> I think many of you have their bios if you got the handout, but let me just note a couple of things quickly. Steve has spent his entire career building and operating transit systems around the country. I can't think of a better, a better set of skills for us today. And Aaron was a Fulbright scholar studying urban planning and transit in China. And you know, China's a place where they don't debate this issue of whether they're going to invest in infrastructure. <laughs> their, whole, their whole success and future is dependent upon it. So I'm sure that that has informed Aaron's perspective. But let me say one more thing about Aaron. Um, I noted in her resume that she's an accomplished lacrosse player, collegiate lacrosse player. And given the spirited community debate, and maybe we'll have some of that here in the next hour, about the transit plan, I suspect her skills at scoring goals and maybe a little high sticking are really going to come in handy in the next 90 days. So let me introduce Aaron and Steve to take on the presentation. Thank you. So I guess we're doing this without, without microphone, so I will try and speak as loudly as I can. Um, a little I, am I speaking loudly enough so far? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, as Craig said, I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Transportation Sustainability. I have a mighty team of two, um, so not quite a department, but we work really closely with all of the metro departments, obviously closely with Steve and with Public Works, um, so I'm really thrilled to be here today. Thanks so much for the opportunity and, and excited for the conversation to go. Steve and I are going to um, sort of trade off a little bit as we talk through this plan. Um, but first, just want to say that, you know, we know we have a problem with gridlock in Nashville, and as we continue to grow, we know that it is going to get worse. The mayor has proposed a really bold and comprehensive transit plan that will start to address our challenges today, as well as set us up for the future. Um, so I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that. I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before, but Nashville is a rapidly growing city. Where our region is expected to grow by a million more people over the next 25 years. We grow by about 100 people a day, um, and we're the third fastest region in terms of job growth and the eighth fastest in terms of population growth. 
So jobs are really driving our growth, which is great for Nashvilleans and graduating Vanderbilt students because that means that there are opportunities here for our residents. But with that growth comes increasing commute times. The chamber did their uh, annual vital signs report and they have said that we've added 111,000 commuters to our roads from 2010 to 2015. Nashville used to be known as a 15 minute town, but everyone that thinks about where you could go in 15 minutes in 2010, that can sometimes take 30 minutes or even longer today. The average Nashvillean spends 34 hours a year in traffic, which costs us about $1,300 each um, in lost productivity. That's time away from our families and increased earnings. And um, commute times are actually one of the single largest, it, it's the single largest predictor in a family's ability to escape poverty. Long commute times um, mean it's, means it's much harder to climb up to the next economic um, income bracket. We also know that roads alone won't fix this. We've already invested in roads, and even though Governor Haslam indicated that his budget won't likely be kind to TDOT, they do spend $2.2 billion a year on roads and highways. We're the fourth per capita in dollars spent on roads and highways. We also know that when new highway projects and new lanes are added, that that only buys us new capacity for a certain period of time. As soon as people learn that, there, that there's a new lane or road, they start taking that um, road, and it actually only improves our congestions for about three to five years. So that's not our best option. So why are we talking about transit? The simple fact is because it moves more people. This is a photo of 60 people in 60 cars and 60 people on a bus. Um, we also know that when it comes to space and being able to move more people efficiently, that autonomous vehicles are going to be part of that solution, but not going to be the only part. Because quite simply, one person in one car isn't going to help us improve the capacity on our roads. We need more high capacity options. A four-car light rail train can move about 16,000 people per hour in each direction. A vehicle lane can move about 1,600. <coughs> From that perspective, it's not even close. Because of this capacity issue, in a growing city like Nashville, transit infrastructure very quickly becomes basic infrastructure. It's as important to the health of our cities as investing in roads, as investing in electricity, and investing in water infrastructure. We're actually one of the last cities of our size that does not have a dedicated funding source for transportation. Portland, Seattle, Charlotte, and Denver are all cities that we compete with for talent and jobs, and all of them are pretty far ahead of us in terms of transit infrastructure and dedicated funding sources. And we need to catch up. The other thing that's changing in Davis County is our demographics. As we move towards 2040, the, 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 the percentage of folks that we consider sort of our peak home buyers from 35 to 65, that percentage is going to shrink from 75% to about 34%. 66% of our home buyers are going to be first time home buyers, millennials, and downsizers, retirees. Th those two markets are, are more often than not looking for more transit oriented development, walkable communities. So this is an entirely change. You know, it's a shift, not just a shift in housing, but it's the basis for a different kind of city. One where you don't need a car for every trip you take. And as our cities are changing and we're trying to meet demands, increasing transportation options is actually helping us just try and meet that demand rather than trying to change behavior, which we know is really tough to do. And I'm going to let Steve talk a little bit about how we got to where we are today. Thank you, Aaron, and let me do a voice check, too. Am I projecting to the back corner okay? No. A little bit more? Okay, we can do that. Yeah, you sort of have to yell. <coughs> I hope that didn't come off as yelling. So, uh, talking about how Let's Move Nashville evolved, first of all, uh, mobility and mobility patterns are inextricably tied to land use and the way we develop as a community. So, I think it's important when we go back to consider Nashville's last comprehensive planning process, the Nashville Next process, which wrapped up in the 2014-2015 timeframe. And one of the things that was concluded in Nashville Next after extensive public engagement, a lot of empiric research, was that Nashvillians wanted more development, more density along our prime corridors and in key cluster zones. And you see that represented in the map to the left, directly out of Nashville Next. 
On the heels of that, the Metro uh, Transit Authority here in Nashville and the Regional Transportation Authority engaged in a 10-county regional transit conceptual plan, the Motion plan. For Nashville and Davidson County, we built extensively off of Nashville Next. And what that essentially said was to build up services in our key corridors, our local corridors such as Murfreesboro Road, Gallatin Pike, and also our regional corridors going out to Murfreesboro, uh, Williamson County, uh, Dixon, Sumner County, etc. And that was the concept and the context of that process. We focused extensively on public engagement. We had uh, 20,000 individual engagements and about 9,000 folks participating in a scenario selection process. So that process was widely recognized around the country for its effort to seek out uh, public <coughs> engagement and public opinion. Largely what we heard from Nashvilleians, and as you would expect, it was spirited discussion was, we know we're going to have to spend resources to work on this issue. Let's do enough to have a real impact. Let's not fritter around the edges. That's where the Let Let's Be National Plan was drawn from with the passage of the Improve Act last year by the state. Local counties in certain sec uh, sections, the more urban counties, were given the option to adopt local funding <coughs> strategies to advance their mass transit plans. Mayor Barry embracing the Improve Act and the In Motion and the Nashville Next plans put forth the Let's Move Nashville program. And that focuses on several of our key corridors for significant capital investment in both light rail and rapid <coughs> bus. And it also uses those spines to build a much more extensive network of expanded bus service, significant sidewalk, pedestrian, bicycle improvements, uh, placemaking improvements, and then building up the overall bus network and features like our access ride door-to-door -door system with more expanded mobility on demand options. So what does Let's Move uh, Nashville mean? First of all, it uh, wouldn't be a good college class if we didn't give you a reading assignment. <laughs> At letsmovenashville.com, you can download the official plan that was released, about 55 pages, with a tremendous amount of detail, not just on the technical approaches, but also on the financing and funding assumptions. Overall, what we're talking about is about a 50% increase in the size of our bus fleet, uh, five light rail corridors covering about 25, 26 miles, more sidewalks, better crossings, safer intersections, a network of 19 regional and neighborhood transit centers, including one here uh, adjacent to or on the Vanderbilt University campus, where local circulation for things like campus shuttles or transportation networking companies or the bicycle and pedestrian network can connect to that regional system not just connecting to the downtown core, but connecting to other neighborhoods in Nashville and ultimately throughout the region. 41% uh, increase in service hours, a focus on our frequent transit network on the bus system. So a dozen of our corridors that currently carry about 70% of our total ridership would see expanded service hours into the 21, 22 hour a day category and service frequencies of no less than, in many cases, exceeding every 15 minutes or better. Uh, frequency and span improvements on just about all of our local transit services. Significant upgrades and expansion in our access ride door-to-door -door system for senior citizens and persons with disability, di disabilities, including real-time information availability and same-day scheduling and an expansion in what we're calling mobility on demand, which could use our access ride system, transportation networking companies, or other demand responsive issues to address the first mile, last mile problem. So perhaps feeding you if you're about a mile or two away from one of those neighborhood transit centers, giving you instantaneous access, again, to feed into that regional network. Early deliverables, because light rail uh, and the heavy capital investments do take time to plan, design, run through environmental analysis, and fund. Early deliverables in the first one to five years are major expansions in the bus network. So the, most of the bus program would be delivered within a three to five year period. 
including additional crosstown routes, longer service hours, more frequent service options, beginning the capital deployment and rapid bus corridors of things like level platform boarding, transit signal priority projects, queue jump projects, where feasible, dedicated lanes to some extent, first and last mile services, working with transportation <coughs> networking companies and other providers, starting the construction of the regional transit centers, and extensive work on our sidewalk, pedestrian, and bicycle infrastructure throughout Nashville and Davidson County. Uh, neighborhood transit centers, the concept is not just to have a place where two or more bus routes come together, but where car share locations would be uh, occurring, electric uh, car sharing, potentially uh, as autonomous vehicles are deployed, they become centers for that activity, and actually built in neighborhood uh, locations where they can be part of that neighborhood context, perhaps connecting to a park or another uh, recreational facility. In fact, we're actually having early conversations with farmers markets about doing um, localized <coughs> farmers markets at those locations. So not just having a transportation connection, but actually a community center for other activities. High capacity corridors, both rapid bus and light rail, would mean faster and frankly to many, more importantly, more reliable service. One of the things we heard consistently throughout the region, not just in Nashville, was we understand travel times will increase with increasing population. That's not as big a concern as the unpredictability of the network. Is it going to take me 20 minutes to get there tomorrow? Is it going to take me 45 minutes to get there? So improving the reliability of those uh, operations. That's the significant reason for the proposal to do a downtown tunnel. Uh, any of you who have been through our downtown network we'll see that it is increasingly becoming an unreliable travel time. Currently on the Metro Transit Authority network, we are averaging 4.5 miles per hour through the downtown core at our rush hours, and it is a significant hindrance, not just to downtown-oriented commutes, but neighborhood-to-neighborhood -neighborhood commutes. So these projects will allow us to do more through routing of services, whether that's bus or rail, to connect neighborhoods not just to the downtown core but to each other. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Aaron uh, simply by saying that we are already as a city on par with many cities our size and larger when it comes to economic activity, tourist attractions, special events, levels of congestion. Where we aren't up to par is the options we're providing to people for faster, reliable, affordable connections. And that's really a large part of the intent of the Let's Move National Plan. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think Steve ran through most of this, but just to make it really clear, um, over the 15-year period uh, um, of the Let's Move Nashville plan, the bus improvements and the frequent transit network will start in the first two years. The rapid bus corridors will start to open in 2023. The first light rail corridor will open in 2026 with the tunnel opening in 2027, and the full system would be built out by 2032. So now let's talk about how we're proposing to fund it. Transportation is definitely an investment. It's an investment in infrastructure for our city and an investment in our future. Um, as allowed under the IMPROVE Act, there were six <coughs> revenue sources that we were available to, um, to raise the surcharges. We selected one, one of them, the development tax wasn't eligible to Davidson County because we aren't growing that fast. We aren't growing by 20%. Um, so there were five options we could, pick, we could choose from and uh, we picked four. The sales tax, a half cent increase um, for the first five years and a full cent um, after that, a 20% increase in the business tax, a quarter percent increase in the um, hotel tax graduating to three eighths, and a 20% increase in the rental car. Um, the sales tax makes up about 93% of the local surcharges and 47% of, of the Davidson County sales tax revenues actually comes from outside the county. So from commuters and visitors. Oh, wonderful. Are you crying? Tone down a little bit. Um, that means that the that Davidson County residents will actually be funding about 35% of the of the um, entire program, which we thought was a really important mix of um, sharing it across funding sources. 
So what will this cost you as an individual? Um, this is the sales tax impact. As I said, it's 93% of, um, of the local surcharge revenues. During the first five years, it'll be about $5 a month. And the, the last 10 years, it'll be about $10 a month. Also included in the program is a fee and reduced fare program. So Nashvillians experiencing poverty will have access to free bus passes. Currently, if you are a Nashvillian experiencing poverty, you pay about $55 a month for your bus pass. Under the Let's Move Nashville program, your sales tax contribution will be considered your payment for the bus pass, and you'll get free bus passes, which will more than pay for itself. Transit investments, the next couple of slides talk about why should we invest in transit. Transit investments, fortunately, are, are investments that have big dividends across the county, um, not just for the users of the system. Um, the, the system over the first 14 years will create about 3,800, create or maintain about 3,800 jobs per year, which will be $3.66 billion in additional labor, labor income for our region. And the mayor is committed to working with council to ensure that, that a large percentage of those, of those jobs go to local businesses as well as minority owned and small businesses. Um, another really important aspect of the system is that it's convenient for people to use. Um, Steve mentioned that, that you know this is, has been right size for Davidson County, but it really starts in our urban core because that's where people are today. That's where our highest jobs and, and um, res population density is. So we know that people will have access to it. When the system is fully built out, 76% of Davidson County residents will be within a half mile and 89% of our jobs will be. The other important thing, um, there's been a lot of conversations about how this impact, how this plan will impact affordability in Nashville. Um, and, and it's important when you're thinking about affordability to really think about housing and transportation costs together. And we think that this plan will help us reduce Nashvillians' cost burdens across those two categories, as well as improve access to opportunities. Um, I think the stat that Craig mentioned was that we're 93rd out of the top 100 cities in the country in terms of worker access to tr transportation. We're also 41 out of the top 50 cities in terms of upward mobility. So that again is that ability to sort of go up to your next um, in the <coughs> bracket. 85% of seniors have poor access to transportation options. Um, and our Office, of trans our Office of Education actually just recently did a study and lack of access to transportation is the number two barrier in MNPS graduates being able to graduate from college. So uh, affordable transportation options will allow people to have more access to those opportunities. Um, it's all, it, transit also benefits folks that even don't ever plan to use it. Um, we, as Craig said, we're a very sprawling region right now. This, this program will really allow us to concentrate our growth in our downtown and midtown urban core, as well as along our transit corridors, as outlined in Nashville Next, which will allow us to preserve open space and preserve our neighborhoods. 85% um, of our smog emissions and 37% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the transportation sector. So providing more options that don't involve getting in your car will help us clean our air. Uh, Transit-oriented cities are mean that that across the board, people have, have more opportunities to physical activity. Um, they also are safer. There are fewer traffic accidents. And even if you don't plan to use it every day, you might use it occasionally to come downtown for a Predators game. Um, and even if you don't use it, your spouse or your teenager might choose to use it, saving you on the cost for additional vehicles. So what's next? I, Steve mentioned that transportation projects are um, up take about 10 to 15 years. Um, through the motion process, we have sort of finished our strategic plan. We currently are in the public engagement um, and council consideration. Council will be, will have their third reading on their ordinance on Tuesday, February 6th. And um, the last two votes have, have gone in our favor. So if that continues, it will be added to the ballot, which will be on May 1st. Um, but even after, um, if we're successful on May 1st, um, that each of the corridors will be their own projects that will move forward in design and engineering and have lots of opportunities for, the, for community engagement, um, including sort of stop selection, um, where the transit centers will be located, et cetera. So that's just an overall summary. We look forward to conversations and, and hope you agree that this is an exciting time for Nashville 
and an exciting opportunity for us as a city to invest in our future. Thank you, Aaron and Steve, for that, uh, that crisp and well-articulated uh, description of the, uh, the plan that we'll be invited to, uh, to affirm or not in, in, in May. Um, we have invited three panelists to join our group, uh, and we'll, um, uh, I'll ask them to speak for a bit about their, uh, uh, their, their, their lens on the mobility issues in our community. And, uh, then I'll ask each of them, I'll give them first shot, shot at asking a question or two of, of Steve and Aaron. Uh, and then with time permitting, we'll open, up the, open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Noah Van Mierlo is a junior majoring in political science uh, here at Vanderbilt University. Um, uh, he has a unique lens, I know, because he's from the Netherlands. Um, I think bikes are the, uh, are, the, are, the, uh, are the most popular mode of transportation, a, a remarkable um, place to visit uh, from many perspectives. Uh, Steve Guild is, uh, is, a, uh, is a tenure veteran with Vanderbilt University. Um, he, uh, he has a particularly good lens on this. He works uh, with the Vanderbilt Sustainability and Environmental Management Office uh, and is working tirelessly on efforts uh, within our community to, uh, to, to focus on, on making us more sustainable uh, and environmentally sensitive. And finally, Walter Searcy is a uh, Vanderbilt Law School, School graduate and um, has simply been a tireless advocate for his all of his life for uh, those in our community that risk being left behind. Uh, he has, uh, he and I have been on the board together at the Red Cross. Uh, he's been uh, in leadership at Senior Citizens Inc., uh, president of Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, and uh, active with the Boy Scouts. So I'm gonna turn it over to the three of them. Talk to us about uh, why you're interested in this, um, uh, how this, uh, the plan, how you might be affected by this plan personally, uh, and then be ready to ask uh, Steve and Aaron a question after the three of you have talked. Hello. So I am the only person on this panel that's a student here. Uh, I'm, unlike many of you, I imagine, I'm relatively new to Nashville, uh, but I love this city already, and I'm in my third year here. And uh, just imagining the possibilities for having a transit plan uh, here. I, I am from the Netherlands, but I currently live in London, where I, uh, some of you might know the tra uh, transportation is, is great. There's the tube. Uh, it's incredible. <laughs> um, it's, very, it's a very different kind of lifestyle that you can have when there is good transit available. In London, if, uh, when I was younger, if, like, if I wanted to go to the movies, I don't have to say, Mom, can you drive me to the movies and then come pick me up when I'm done. No, I can just say, Mom, go to the movies and then take a five-minute tube ride and go wherever I want to go. Uh, the same thing here. As a student, the uh, transit plan would allow me to explore Nashville much more. If I, uh, or not have to worry about taking an Uber from the airport. I can take uh, transportation. Um, and there are a lot of people coming uh, to Nashville uh, because, you know, the predators are good now and <laughs> the Titans are actually getting better. And from what I've, uh, from what I've heard, that's very new. Uh, <laughs> so downtown is going to get even worse. Um, <laughs> Before, before I came here, I didn't know how to drive, and my freshman year I was made fun of for not having a driver's license, um, because I am an American citizen, I'm a registered, registered folk here now. But then, uh, a few months ago, I finally got my driver's license, and I'd heard people talk about Nashville traffic, about how it's bad, apparently, and then I had to, I had to experience it myself. And I think that, if anything, should just be like, yeah, I want transit. Have you? <laughs> It takes 15 minutes just to get to Hillsborough Village. You, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a journey. Um, so it's, all, it's also freshmen here, are not, uh, freshmen students at the university are not allowed to bring uh, a car to campus. And my freshman year, what I, reg I, what I regret is not exploring Nashville more often. 
having a transit hub right right over here uh, would make that a lot more possible to go to East Nashville, try all the restaurants, um, to go to a Predators game, to go to a Titans game. Uh, it just makes it so much more, it makes it so much more possible. And so, and, and and it does not only college students that are affected by um, this plan. You know, high school students, students at Hume Fog just downtown. Imagine how uh, their parents might feel when it's like, oh, mom, I want to stay after school until like five o'clock. Can you come pick me up then? And then they have to wait in that traffic. Um, it just it it makes move getting around so much easier, obviously, and. For someone who wants to spend time here, spend, you know, set up a career here in Nashville, I love Tennessee. It's a great state. This is a great city. Uh, transit would make that so much more affordable. I don't have to worry about buying a car. I don't have to, wor I don't have to set aside part of my budget to gas. Um, and as someone who has very little money, that is very important to me. Um, and that, that basically is why I want to see transit here happen. Obviously, I won't be the one to reap the benefits, unfortunately, because this, uh, I think, 2032, when it'll all be done. Uh, I'll be, who knows? You can, stay, you can stay here, Ron. <laughs> Just a few more years of school. Um, yeah, for my children, exactly. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but future students, I imagine, would love to be able to have that opportunity to move around Nashville in a way that I couldn't. And so I don't, I'm not, I'm not being selfish and saying I want transit so I can go to the Titans playoff game next year. Um, I want transit so that people in the future will be able to. Like I want transit because I want to grow up here, I want to have children here hopefully, and I want them to be able to explore, uh, explore the city and explore the region hopefully as uh, we go to the future. Uh, because I've I've only been outside Davidson County a few times, you know. Um, I've been to Franklin. Uh, I went to a state park the, a, a few months ago. And it, there's so much more to explore outside of Nashville. And as a college student that comes here, you might think, oh, Nashville is a, uh, just a city. There's not much outside of, of uh, Nashville. Well, even is Tennessee. I didn't know before I came here uh, much about anything outside uh, Nashville. but. There's a lot to explore, and for what seems to be what doesn't seem to be um, a huge cost to the average citizen, I, I'm all for this. And I know it, it might sound uh, silly coming from someone uh, from a college student who you know doesn't pay taxes yet, but I plan to. And <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't have a job. That's what I mean. I'm not to no tax fraud or anything. Um, <laughs> but there's nothing I'd rather spend my hard-earned money on than good transit because it doesn't only benefit me. It ben benefits everyone around you in one way or another. So thank you. That's great. Thank you. Steve. Is there anything you want to ask the? Uh, well, why don't we go through the three and oh. I'll come back to you to, oh. to, uh, okay, to ask good. your questions. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I am very excited about this plan. Um, again, my name is Steve Gill and I'm with the sustainability office here at Vanderbilt. But uh, even prior to that, I was a bus rider. Um, and I am a Davidson County homeowner. Um, I pay par property tax and, and sales tax. Obviously, I've got school aged children. Um, but I am very supportive of this plan. Um, and I would encourage uh, any of you, if you haven't tried public transit uh, between now and May 1st, uh, give it a try. Um, the system's very friendly as it is now, and it doesn't, the, the, the first few slides that Aaron had talked about of more of the same might not sound like the, the sexy thing, like it's not jetpacks, but um, it's like, hey, we're going to give you more of the same, but um, the bus service here is very good, and more of the same is a very good first step as far as rolling out uh, this transit plan is concerned. Um, so I'm excited about that as a user. I know a lot of people at Vanderbilt are excited about that as well, and that from our office's perspective, from the, from the sustainability perspective, and as Aaron mentioned, you know, we do want to make sure we decrease our greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with commuting, um, and we want to make sure that we don't have an increase in smog um, and, air, and other air pollutants as our 
population grows here in Middle Tennessee. Um, a lot of you who have been to other cities uh, in the United States, you already know that those cities are very cognizant of air quality, very cognizant of uh, air alerts. If you go to a city like Denver, or Los Angeles, or Phoenix, they're not only are they battling with the transit issues that we are talking about here and battling with issues related to their carbon footprint, but the air quality for people who live in those cities sometimes is very horrendous. Um, we're lucky in Nashville that we don't have as many air quality alerts or severe air quality alerts as much as other cities do. Um, and we want to keep it that way. And one of the best ways for us to do that um, is to keep those cars off the road. Um, so this transit plan builds into that. We had a mention earlier too about uh, future VU or future view, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and so I would encourage you to go to that, uh, to the future view website. Um, and there was also a very good talk that was given uh, on campus back in October of 2017 related to future view and accessibility, sustainability, and transportation, and how land use planning is going to change here on the Vanderbilt campus and how transit is a big part of that. Um, and Steve had mentioned earlier about how the transit plan is, is not only about um, motorized transportation, but more walkability and more bikeability. And our campus plan is going to focus on a lot of that too. Um, obviously, we, you know, we're pretty close to the middle of downtown. And we also have a lot of friends, our neighbors, um, who are interested <laughs> in transit as well. St. Thomas Hospital, uh, HCA TriStar, Belmont, the Caterpillar headquarters that's here. There's a Microsoft uh, headquarters or campus that's on uh, Charlotte Avenue. Um, so all of these uh, employers and all the people who work there, they all want this. We all want the same thing. So um, you know, they all want something better in terms of transit. And we as Vanderbilt employees want more uh, or better options in terms of transit. So um, please, you know, take a look at the at the plan and give give public transportation a try between now and May 1st. Um, and again, for those of you who live outside of Davidson County, I would encourage you to do the same, because we're going to have more in terms of uh, uh, rapid buses and regional buses and regional transportation as well. Um, thank you. If, if I can add just one note, I, uh, I don't think I mentioned that, uh, that Walter is uh, a member of the Metropolitan Transit Authority Board and has been since 2015 and in addition is involved with a group Transit for Nashville which is a coalition that is that has been formed to uh, to advocate for uh, good mobility uh, in our community so Walter with that it's all yours thanks Craig it, um, I think it's important to point out that from Aaron and Steve you're the public aspect of a public private partnership uh, Nashville for Transit is the private aspect of the coalition between the two of us and we hope that we're exemplary of the PP3 kinds of developments that we will experience downstream and that will make this uh, a truly doable experience uh, in transit expansion. Now let me tell you a couple of things about me. One is that uh, uh, my portfolio pretty much has been uh, one of advancing social justice and economic equity in our community. And uh, so being involved in this transit thing seems to be a little uh, off that path. But to the contrary, it's right at the center of it. Because this transit development is going to be the, our greatest opportunity and maybe one of the few that we will have uh, in our short-term futures to advance um, employment significantly in the area, adding 50,000 new permanent jobs. You saw the slide, 3,850 uh, jobs per annum uh, over a 15-year period that uh, the math says that's in excess of 50,000 new employment opportunities that are living wage opportunities. We're not talking about um, um, entry-level propositions at 10, 11, 12 dollars an hour. 
we're talking about jobs that average 20 plus dollars an hour and that have skills associated with them so permanent careers are built around those that's a b many of us are concerned about the reduction in the inventory of affordable housing in our area and it is that is a problem that is reaching critical proportions and this transit expansion is going to be our actual best opportunity to expand the inventory of affordable housing in the metro area. Uh, notwithstanding the naysayers, uh, the fact that the state legislature historically has meddled in the affairs of Davidson County in its efforts to try to expand the inventory of affordable housing, they actually did something quite progressive, and I say that as a whisper, because I don't want them to get the idea that they that we're besmirching them with the term progressive. <laughs> but in allowing us to build, allowing us to designate transit-oriented development corridors alongside the light rail corridors is going to ensure that and a minimum of 30% of all housing opportunities that develop on those corridors will be affordable. Uh, that is, in and of itself, uh, says that there is a nexus between social justice and economic opportunity and transit. And when the mayor asked me to join this process, it was a no-brainer. And now we're asking you to do the same thing. Because May 1, we'll all have an opportunity to get on board with this and vote in the affirmative on this issue. The council hasn't put it on the ballot yet, but the likelihood is that it will. Uh, so that on February 7, if you don't have a yard sign, one will be available for you. Um, we will be talking about trying to get out the vote. Um, with that, I think that uh, Greg will pass it back to you and see what other uh, queries. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> Walter, we may invite you back to be in our third panel when we we'll are talking extensively about the uh, about the affordable so housing. The storage is empty. I'm available to you. Great. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, give a give a first shot at asking a question of uh, Steve and Aaron. I'm going to uh, take the chair's prerogative and ask the first one. Um, I think there was a surprise that the plan was not only bold uh, in terms of the dollars, but that the uh, notion of a tunnel um, was included in the plan. Um, and it's been. Um, uh, urban legend here that uh, you could never do a subway in in Nashville because we have all this limestone rock, uh, and of course the tunnel is not anticipated as a as a subway system underground, but um, uh, it feels like a crucial element. And I wondered if one or both of you would speak to how it came about uh, and uh, your your uh, your take on on its importance to the overall plan. So yeah, the the. Um <laughs> the subway wasn't, or the uh, tunnel wasn't directly born out of the end motion process. I'm going to be honest, when we did end motion, we sort of punted on downtown. <laughs> uh, we had the, we, called, we referred to it as the big blue box in the middle of the plan. And when we worked with Public Works and a number of traffic engineers doing modeling, to be frank, the trends on downtown traffic and congestion are somewhat frightening. Um, just with projects on the books, so just those projects now under construction and in some phase of development, so people going through the permitting process, there's a forecast of up to, within the relative short term, about another 35% increase in traffic volume in the downtown core. So when we start, we knew through the motion process, we knew through the transit planning process to make a, a transit system more than just a connection to downtown, to make it possibly the best way to get from East Nashville to West End, or North Nashville to Antioch, we really had to deal with getting through the downtown core in an efficient manner. And when we started to look at those volumes, given the very narrow streets, it became 
kind of a mathematical impossibility, for lack of a better word. I am not an engineer, and I am certainly not a Fulbright scholar. Uh, but even that level of relatively simple math became kind of vexing. And when some of the engineering professionals posed, they, well, what about a tunnel? You know, frankly, it was like, I think with most of the general public, it was initially met with a, are you out of your mind? And then the more we looked at both the options and the specifics associated with it, it became, you know, this could be the transformational project uh, in the entire system. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is just to address the, the limestone issues specifically. Um, so we, we had a group of um, transportation engineers that were in town a couple weeks ago, um, folks from HDR, which is the city's consultants, as well as WSP, who um, just came because they've been interested in the issue and have, are building tunnels all over the world. And with the new sort of tunnel boring technology, um, limestone is actually one of the best rocks to be able to tunnel through because it is self-reinforcing. You don't have to constantly be reinforcing it. And the fact that it's just limestone and it's not a combination of different materials, that actually does make it easier because you can program the tunnel boring machine once um, and you don't have to keep starting and stopping. Um, so we were, we were also impressed by that technical feasibility that we heard despite the urban legends that exist out there um, and, and, and limiting it to just the sort of 1.8 mile section of downtown we think, like Steve said, will be transformational for the entire system, will be something that we can do um, that won't go, you know, the, the scope creep won't happen so that we can stay on time and on budget. No cut and cover. No cut and cover. Yeah, yeah, so the, the other thing that Walter's referring to is that there's two different ways that you can tunnel. One of them is called cut and cover, where you sort of go in from the top, and you tunnel, and then you cover it back up. Um, the, our preferred method of being able to do it, and our feasibility analysis says that we should be able to do this, is to use a tunnel boring machine, which means that we could enter from the side of downtown and go underneath downtown, so we wouldn't have to do, it would, it would have much less of a surface, surface impact on the businesses and activities in downtown. Thank you both. Noah, I'm going to turn it over to you for one question, and then Steve and Walter, and then we'll open it up for the couple of minutes that I think we'll have remaining. All right, so question I'm thinking, I'm thinking towards the future. Um, obviously, this is not a finished plan to last Nashville for centuries. How does it allow for, uh, for additional improvements, things to be added on later? How, where, how, where is that flexibility shown? Let me start because I know one of the things we've heard from some of the critics is, well, this is a Davidson County plan and that's not regional in nature. Um, to a large extent, it is regional in nature. The Improve Act really only gave specific counties the ability to raise revenue. So kind of by design, each county's approach will be county by county. But because Davidson County's plan drew from the broader and motion process, those are all connected pieces and participating through both the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Regional Transportation Authority, a number of our outlying counties are anxiously awaiting seeing what happens on May 1st with a full intent to start their own processes to tie into that system. Um, we are, by virtue of our travel movements, by our interstate highway design, by our uh, arterial design, we are a hub and spoke region. So many areas that are flat, kind of have a lot of crosstown and a lot of options. We are by design a hub and spoke region. Nashville, Davidson County is the hub. So Noah, very much the intent is that, that this approach, uh, once adopted, will grow outward. And that's what you've seen in other cities. Denver did not start with what they have today. They started with phase one, went to phase two, went to phase three. Speak. All right. Thank you. Um, question one, when do I get my jetpack? Um, right, no, um, but one thing I didn't mention um, when I was encouraging people to use public transit was that one thing that has benefited me greatly is the Music City Tracker, okay? It's, it's a wonderful app that lets you know, you know when your bus is coming, when the next one's coming, uh, what routes are best, it can map things out for you, what time are you gonna arrive at the other end based on a specific stop. Um, so if you haven't downloaded that app, please do. And that's really what my question is related to is that, um, and I want to show one other quick story too, sorry. Also at the new um, transit centers, there are little LED readouts that tell you when the next bus is coming and, and all that other good stuff. So 
um, in this plan, you know, how much money is set aside for things like new technology? Obviously, um, apps get dated and and uh, bus stops have to get replaced and things like that. So, in terms of information sharing, or you know, providing real time information, e you know, either to riders or people who are waiting for a rider, um, what does this plan have to say about that? And I want to want to uh, give a shout out and a, uh, to a to a fellow. Uh, colleague in, um, uh, in our uh, computer science and engineering uh, program, Abhishek Duby. Uh, you can also go out and look for an app called T-Hub, uh, and uh, it does some similar things, Steve, to the one you're describing, which is quite good as well. Uh, so take a peek at that, and, uh, uh, and if you come back for our, uh, for our next forum in February, I know you'll hear more about that, that project and work as well. Well, the first thing I, I would say, Steve, is you, we, if you if you download the report, 55-page report, you're not going to see a specific, here's what we're spending on technology, because frankly, technology will be embedded in everything from um, what, you know, newest generation light rail vehicles on up. I would touch on a few things specifically in terms of overall plan design, and one is generally the theme of seamlessness. So as we talk about things, for instance, like mobility on demand, where maybe you're still a little bit too far away from that light rail line to walk, or a little bit too far away from that bus route to get to the bus stop. So the idea of having through that integrated app, and these are discussions and negotiations that are going on now, to have a specific app that says, okay, I'll have my Lyft ride or my Uber ride or whatever the next version of that is. Maybe an entrepreneurial student here will figure out um, how to make money off that. And in those conversations, because they are open architecture, the idea of integrating our real-time information in the transit network with private providers' real-time information, say, yeah, we can pick you up at your house, rather than taking you 10 miles downtown or, or 15 miles across town or over to Vanderbilt, we can get you to the nearest transit station with high-quality service, high-frequency or, or fixed guideway and tie that to specific times. So Lyft might say, well, we can pick you up in four minutes, but if we do that, your wait time's gonna to be too long. We know based on the performance of the system right now, we're gonna pick you up in nine minutes, and that will only give you a two minute wait at that transit center, that transit hub. A program, a project we're actively working on now, because almost literally as soon as we had real time information available, people said, that's great, but when can I pay on my phone? So the idea of uh, advanced fare collection systems, in fact, actually, um, this upcoming month, we expect the Metro Transit Authority Board to award a contract for next generation fare collection. The idea when you're doing that seamlessly, whether it's transportation networking companies, taxis, bike share, parking operators, that you can kind of do that all through an account-based system and make that as easy and seamless as possible. Yeah, the only things I would add is that it, we're, we're also talking about electrifying the bus fleet, so it would be a fully electric bus system, as well as having Wi-Fi on all of the um, transit coaches. So um, I think Steve is exactly right that technology and sort of state-of-the-art, forward-looking thinking will be embedded in the entire program. I'm going to defer uh, my question. Let's see if we can get some of the audience okay. to participate. Let me start and ask if there are some students that uh, that have questions. Just to oh, right here. Hi, I'm Yawan. I'm actually a senior at Venerable, so I'm a Chinese international student, and I still don't have a car in Nashville now. And really excited to have National Transit Plan to have transit in the future. And my question is um, for you, last week you mentioned about the first mile and the last mile uh, problem. So I, I thought like that was like using Lyft or other ride share program to solve that problem. But I doubt if there's any like uh, affordability in that solution. And also like now, just it really struck me in the last one year and last few months that what happened in China is this emerging uh, the Oculus bike sharing program that's also like sweeping out different US cities, metropolitan area like Denver, Seattle, and uh, DC areas. I just wonder if um, there's any like plan, like collaboration between the metro government and also like 
at the National MTA on that um, to introduce introduction to this uh, program to um, national area to provide affordable like first mile last mile solution because I also know that the government has invested a lot in the natural bee cycle, but it's still not affordable. Even for me as a student, I have to pay for at least five dollars for one ride. So I just wonder if there's any solution related to that. Thank you so much. Bike share. So uh, first of all, part of the uh, issue with bike share again coming back to an integrated and seamless system, um, and actually in, in portions of these. For instance, a lot of what we're looking at with mobility on demand, we do partial write downs of those fares, number one. And number two, by reducing the distance of the trip, well now if I live in Antioch, I don't need to take that, that transportation network and company 20 miles, maybe I have to take it two miles, which kind of brings down that affordability. The other issue is moving to an account-based fare payment system also opens up the opportunity for third-party sponsorship. So, Aaron touched on the fact that the plan already incorporates programs for lower income uh, individuals to have free transit access. But for instance, uh, we're going to be aggressively working with employers and other affiliated groups. Uh, well, you know, what might Vanderbilt um, provide to students, staff, and faculty, or what might other employers provide to help with that piece? The other, the other part of it, particularly with bike sharing, is um, having to build out that infrastructure so we can, you know, if, if you're going to use B-Cycle, whether you make it affordable or not, and there's really no place safely to navigate the bicycle, you know, that is an issue. So in, a, in complementary design, what we're doing with neighborhood transit centers and the corridor development itself is looking at the complete aspects of that trip. So how might I safely be able to walk it, bike it, or what are my other options available? Um, but part of it is with these network of outlying neighborhood transit centers saying, okay, if you're trying to get from Madison to Antioch, you don't necessarily have to take the $25 ride on the ride share. You know, it's a much reduced um, fee to get to the closest center and then use that really affordable hub system to get you within throughout the region. Yeah, the, the only things I would add is that I think we're very focused on the fact that a walkable and bikeable community is, is one that is more friendly for, for transit. And I actually think the sort of lifts and Ubers of the world would also say that a city that is more walkable and transit oriented is also a more ride sharing friendly city. And so all of those things need to be integrated and, um, and seamless as, as Steve talked about. We're talking with a number of the dockless bike share companies. I think one, we, we see that as a really big opportunity to expand our bike share. Obviously, our bike share right now is focused on in downtown and where a lot of the tourist attractions are. So dockless bikes will allow us to really expand out into the urban core. Um, I think the issue, we're working on guidelines right now as a city, and the focus will be how do we make sure we don't have 10 different operators so you don't have to pay you know, the $5 to B-Cycle and then the $5 to OFO and then the $5 to Zagster um, you know, to get across the city. And so how do we, again, seamless and integrated is the theme of the day. If I can add one. If I may, uh, is that in the transit system now already is very bike friendly in terms of the bike and bus, and I, I've done that a few times myself. And if you do, if you own a bike and you live close to a, a, a bus route, you can bike there, put your bike on the bus, and then vice versa when you come back. And Vanderbilt's going to be working very hard to help promote that as well too. Question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Chandler Barnes. I'm a computer engineering senior from Old Hickory, Hermitage area, uh, here at Vanderbilt. Um, I am in an online class right now um, <clears throat> about self-flying cars, right? So it's, it's, I know that sounds like something so far off, but that's realistically within the next 10 years, which is the completion date for the first of the light rail systems. I'm 100% for more affordable transit, more accessible transit in the national area. I'm skeptical of the commitment and the timeline um, before we get these technologies, which by most professional accounts are already slightly outdated. Um, but 10 years from now, when we, when we reach a completion date um, in any meaningful capacity, they'll be light years behind the technologies <coughs> that'll be being released by private companies and that other cities that are further ahead in their transit plans than Nashville will already have invested in. Um, so I'm just worried of us building up a storefront right before Amazon comes out. So, 
And I hope you took that as the advertisement it is for the second forum that we're going to be holding in February. Uh, we'll be focused exclusively on, the, on these issues of new technologies. But I'm going to leave it to these two to an answer the hard question. So um, Nashville was actually one of 10 cities in the world and one of the four cities in the country to participate in the Bloomberg Aspen Initiative on Autonomous Vehicles. And I have a feeling that we were invited because they knew we were getting ready to make this big transit plan. And so participating in that venue meant that we had the auto manufacturers came and presented to us about what their technologies are and when they would be rolling out. We had experts from all, sort of all over the world sort of telling us the state of the autonomous vehicle technology. Um, so the, fir the first answer to your question is that um, capacity is actually not a technology problem, it's a geometry problem. And, and the reason why we're focusing on select corridors, because those are our most congested corridors today, and they will continue to be our most congested corridors in the future. And autonomous vehicles, uh, we actually, um, Vanderbilt hosted a multimodal workshop, <laughs> was that only last week, two weeks ago? And there was a, a professor who specializes in autonomous vehicles, and he said, that it won't actually address your capacity, it won't increase your capacity. Um, so focusing on transit on your congestion corridors is the right way for cities to go. But autonomous vehicles will absolutely be a part of the um, crosstown connections, the um, first to last mile connections, the places where high capacity transit doesn't necessarily make sense from an economic perspective. Um, again, what, what Steve said as well is that when we do start working on these projects, they will all of them will be some sort of a public-private partnership. And what we're seeing is that construction engineering companies across the world are starting to create their own technology departments and programs because they have to be infusing that into their work. So I, I, don't, I don't have a doubt in my mind that this will be a state-of-the-art system. The, the only thing I'd add to what Aaron had to say is a lot of the cities that you mentioned that are kind of leading edge on this stuff are using it to complement pre-existing or emerging high-capacity transit corridors. So that's kind of the piece that Nashville <coughs> lacks with respect to that discussion. So frankly, putting something in place you know, is really important. And the other thing I would say on technology is, to Aaron's point earlier, so success on May 1st just means we go into more design and detailed planning. All of those technologies will evolve and emerge through the course of that process. So we're not locking in place, oh, we're going to buy the light rail vehicle or adopt the technology that Denver just put in or what have you. And frankly, we've attracted interest from all over the world with sort of the leading, um, the leading edge technologies really in all of these modes to say the opportunity in Nashville is it's not an adaptive system. You're kind of starting from scratch. So things like catenary free light rail, as an example, that's starting to emerge in the Middle East. So make no mistake, you know, it's not your grandfather's train uh, anymore, and a lot of those pieces, will you'll see that emerge over the next few years. Got time for one more question. Hi, uh, I'm a senior uh, here in the middle, and my question pertains to the tunnel aspect of the project. Um, as I look through the plan itself, I think that um, the one item I think with the greatest amount of this obviously is the tunnel at almost a billion dollars. And I think it also makes it one of the most more fragile parts of the plan. Um, maybe in the event that uh, the plan cannot get as much revenue as it can, um, I, I, I would say that the light rail will probably have to be, uh, one aspect of the design that will have to be compromised on in some way. And uh, perhaps um, this would throw a lot of the obviously high frequency capacity corridors which all route through this one tunnel uh, into um, concern as how they'll be routed through downtown. And so um, I want to relate um, the uncertainty, I think, oh, in my opinion, of constructing this tunnel with, um, I guess, uh, this addition, I guess, that um, perhaps downtown traffic is just too unmanageable to uh, solve at grade or on the street. Um, because I think that, um, what a lot of other cities um, have done with their existing networks, I think, is to uh, mitigate traffic in such a way as to prioritize um, traffic on the street. I think that um, that is a uh, usable and uh, alternative as well for Nashville as well. Um, and so I was just wondering if there are any um, alternative solutions proposed, such as uh, like traffic congestion uh, cordons, maybe around like, the I-40 corridor, and where um, uh, traffic could be mitigated downtown as to uh, making the tunnel uh, more of a uh, possibility in no longer as opposed to right now. 
I think I heard a, a question about traffic prioritization in that. So uh, you might want to finish with uh, responding to that, and uh, then we're going to have to let our students get to class. <laughs> Well, I, we, we obviously looked at a lot of different options for downtown. I mean, I, I think Steve covered it really well in terms of knowing how much growth is about to happen downtown, the existing narrow streets that we have, um, knowing that limestone is, is absolutely material that we can tunnel through. Um, yes, it is an expensive investment. Um, elevated rails actually would be more expensive, so um, I, I hate to use the word cost effective, but it's, it you know, we really felt like that was the most cost-effective investment to be able to keep downtown Nashville moving and when it, this does connect to the rest of the county and the rest of the region, we'll keep the entire region moving. Um, in terms of prioritization on streets, um, I think that we, for, for transit, that is something that we have been looking at and, and considering. Um, the tunnel will actually also be for the rapid bus corridor, so we will be able to take some of the buses off of the downtown streets, which will help with overall congestion, um, but I think you know, if there are some select corridors where sort of, a, you know, the bus prioritization does make sense, I think we would look at that in the future. And we are always coordinating with, with TDOT on their sort of highway projects, um, such as their 440 project that they're getting ready to kick off to. Well, uh, please join me in a round of applause for our... speak for all of them. I can't tell you how much we are uh, impressed about the uh, about the level of interest in this topic. Uh, we, will, we will do our best to find a bigger venue for the meeting in February. Uh, so put down February 19th on your calendars. Come back for another free sandwich and uh, we'll talk to technology. Thank you so much. The Music City Star is your